scripture reading is Mark uh, 2, colon 23 to 3, colon 6, pages 8, 14. One Sabbath he was going through the cornfields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave that some of his to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. So when I was a junior in high school, I lived in Barcelona for a year with a Spanish family while I attended an American school. And the family I was assigned to was wealthy, and for some reason I never understood got together with three or four other families at a kind of house church on Sundays. Now there was a priest, although I have no idea where he came from or where he went to afterwards. There was never anything printed or written. So we would gather together and the service would start and it would just be this sea of Spanish that just washed over me, and I drowned it. There were call and response moments. I never knew when it was, and I never knew what to say. There were prayers that apparently everyone else knew. No idea. Songs. And always words, 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 words. Now, if you learn another language, you can get reasonably good but when you walk into a situation you haven't encountered before, suddenly there's a whole new flock of words and concepts you arrive at, and suddenly you can only manage a tow truck in English. You can only get your hair cut in English. No matter how adept you are at discussing the architecture of Antonio Gaudi. Now initially, the church was yet another forum where I had no idea what was going on, and I just let it wash over. I wasn't frustrated, I wasn't anxious, because no one expected me to do anything but sit there and be quiet. They knew I wasn't Catholic, so so long as I was polite, that was all they wanted. But in every service, there was a moment, I don't know, three to five minutes long, when the fog fell away. From the very beginning, when my Spanish wasn't good enough to order an ice cream cone by pointing at a board of flavors, I wanted vanilla, and I kept saying vanilla, and finally someone goes, oh, by Nia! I'm like, you are uh, killing me here. <laughs> I didn't even want vanilla, but I knew what it was. So I would sit there in that sea of Spanish and I would only catch one or two words, but it was enough. And I would recognize the Bible story. 
And instead of being lost or at sea or zoned out, suddenly I was on solid ground. I was connected to my history and the history of my biological family back in New England. And I was connected to the history of my host family in Spain. You know, I knew the drill, right? You read a Bible story and then you connect it to your life today. So I would sit there and in my head, I'd think about the prodigal son or Mary and Martha, whoever. Jesus healing someone, man, he heals a lot of people and it sounds the same every time. But I would think about that and I would think about how it connected to my life. That was church for me. When life switches from overwhelmed to grounded. When an ancient story takes me out of free fall and anchors me in a place and a time. The attention that I pay to particular words in our Bible readings together probably comes out of that period. Although I love that kind of exploration of what particular words mean in other languages before I went to Spain. But if you had asked me, I couldn't have told you that that was church. It just was. Church is when I feel grounded. And once I knew that, I could find it at my gym where I have never ever felt grounded in my life, or that I even belonged there, until I found the gym that I go to now and that I love. I felt that feeling of being grounded at the ghost train rail trail arrivals process, when so many ultra marathoners come to run 100 miles over 30 hours. And I know you will be surprised to hear this, but those are not my people. <laughs> but it felt like having so many other people care that I had my spot, that I felt grounded, that other people had their spots and they felt like they knew where they were supposed to be. I felt like church to me. Yeah. And it doesn't have to have anything to do with Jesus. Or rather, it has everything to do with Jesus. In today's reading, Jesus his disciples are in conflict with the Pharisees about obeying the Sabbath. In the creation story in Genesis, in the Exodus story of liberation from slavery in Egypt, God takes a deliberate step of resting in order to complete the work at hand. In the Roman world, the expectation was that reasonable people, reliable, trustworthy, good citizens, would work all the time. It was a society of networks and connections. So you were often working for the more powerful people in your network so that you would get more benefit later on. And of course, they were working for the more powerful people in their network so that they would get benefit later on. And up it went until you got to the emperor. To take a day off from work was to say you were lazy, was to say you didn't love your kids, that you didn't want your family to be safe and secure. So to observe Sabbath, to have a day off from productive work, was to say you were not Roman, you were Jewish. It was a way to say that you believed in a God who would overthrow the way the world worked and never stopped working to support the rich and the powerful. To observe the Sabbath was to say that your God was bringing in a new world where rest was part of the work. And everyone, owner and slave, man and woman, parent and child, and even the animals, Got to rest and to connect with God's abundance. So why is Jesus picking a fight with connecting with God's abundance? Because he's clearly seeking confrontation with the authorities over how he's keeping the Sabbath. Connecting with God's abundance seems like a good thing, something that's built into the Ten Commandments. Well, just like those unkind rules about the moose getting a beer, there were rules about how one was supposed to observe the Sabbath. 
And the Pharisees' whole MO was to say that if we all just followed the rules more faithfully, we would all be closer to God. And like any group with a variety of members, there were a number of Pharisees who used those rules as weapons to change connecting to God's abundance into a kind of competition to see who was better than whom. And what had been a form of identity became an idol. Jesus is pointing out that maybe the way Sabbath was being kept had become an idol, had become an idol no one knew they were putting on a pedestal. At least until it was time to heal a man with a withered hand and decide whether it should be done then or not. Now, way back in Barcelona, I couldn't have told you what church was to me. I don't even know that I could have told you, you know, 11 years ago before I started this. But once I got lost in those weekly services in Spain, I found out that Bible passages were anchoring for me. I think there are probably parts of our church service here that define us in healthy ways. And there are probably parts that we idolize, that we protect in a way that cuts people out for no good reason. Now, as we work on our purpose statement, I'd like to invite you into a couple of experiments we're going to run, and then we'll talk about later. So, just to review, because June's going to be very, very, very. This week we're having church here. You figured that out. Great. <laughs> Next week, church here, 10 a.m. Pay attention. Just see what it's like. The following week, June 16th, Father's Day, we're going to worship with Hollis at Rocky Pond. And I have details for you for that, but I will put in the bulletin next week. I will be up in Maine celebrating my parents' 60th anniversary with my sister and brother-in-law from Hong Kong, my niece from California, and my nephew from London. And my parents get to have all their ducklings under one roof for about a week. Then the following week, June 23rd, at 9 a.m., yep, 9 a.m., we will meet, some of us will meet here for a very short 15-minute prayer service, and then some of us will go over to the firehouse for a pancake breakfast. Some of us will go elsewhere to other worship services and other venues. I invite people to branch out and try different things on that June 23rd. Maybe go to the Hindu Temple in Nashua, or the Jehovah's Witnesses, or maybe other UCC churches in Mason, or Wilton, or Amherst. And finally, on the last Sunday in June, we will have our first worship service at the lake. And hopefully it will not be quite as chilly and windblown as it has. the first service has been there the past few years. In all of these services, I want to ask you to look at what makes those experiences church for you. What was missing in the service you went to that you really loved? What surprised you that a pancake breakfast in a firehouse could be just as much church as sitting in a sanctuary on a Sunday morning? where we're going to take our different experiences, maybe even of the same event, and see if we can get better putting into words what is church for us. Because when we are truly following God's call, we are healing and being healed. We are feeding and being fed. We are standing up to authority and we are listening deeply. And we are always, always making sure that God's abundance is part of our identity that we share with others. 
no matter what day of the week it is, no matter what language we're speaking. Amen.